Good morning, everyone. It's Pastor Jim Harkowitz from the Canyon Community Church, Lake of California. It's December the 10th, 2023. This morning, we'll be looking at John chapter 6, looking at the famous Bread of Life discourse that Jesus gave. First part of a two-part message. Glad you're with us. Let's join your message in progress. I hope you continue to pray for the children of church ministry and um, all those little ones going back. It's just awesome to see kids in church. And uh, so much goes on back there as they're learning God's word and God's word to be in the soul and the heart. So I, I just pray as you think about the children of church workers, the different ones, pray for God's blessing in their lives that they to just fill them, anoint them just to speak his truth and impart to them. And so they're learning, even though the hands are going everywhere and they're all very busy. It, is absorbing God's Word. It's a wonderful thing to watch. Please open your Bibles with me, if you would, to the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to John. We're we'll looking at John chapter 6 again this morning, and in this chapter we're going to find the famous Bread of Life discourse that, was, that contains the first of seven I am statements or claims made by Jesus in this Gospel. It's unique to John's Gospel, the seven I am's. I'll just kind of brief, briefly just highlight them. In chapter 6, we have the first one, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Some of you know this. The second one is found in chapter 8. It says, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The third one is, I am the door in chapter 9. Chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Chapter 11, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Number 6 is, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John chapter 14. And in chapter 15, number 7 is, I am the true vine. We're going to explore each of those statements. And we see that this morning in the Bread of Life Discourse here in John chapter 6. In this Bread of Life Discourse, which is, by the way, this is part one of a two-part message, Jesus is going to take the task, the crowd that was following him. And he's going to address and reveal their impure motives for following him. Plus, he's going to point out that eternal life or Zoe life we've been learning about in John's Gospel is not obtained through works or through seeking miracles, but rather through trusting and believing in Him and having a personal relationship with Him. Jesus will make some very difficult statements in His teaching discourse, and the people are not going to like it at all. In fact, if we saw ahead already, at the end of the chapter, many more are no longer going to walk with Jesus. He's going to thin the herd down from thousands of people down to barely the twelve. Serious reduction of ministry. But that's okay. Because many more following Jesus for all the wrong reasons. And just as people of John chapter 6 were no longer follow Jesus or walk with him, even today some people will cease to walk with Jesus when his words interfere or contradicts their lifestyles or how they're living. So I offer a caution. This section of, God of Scripture is going to probe and challenge your motives as to why you're here this morning. And it may have offend or upset you. It is what it is. God's Word has a way of doing that. And so this passage is going to come forth. Two questions that are going to probe you in your faith is why you're here this morning. First off, are you following Jesus and by extension attending church to know Jesus more and to serve Him? Or are you following Jesus and attending church services to, for what Jesus is going to do for you? to be entertained or to stroke your ego, make you feel good about yourself or to seek some physical relief or, or maybe you hear cultural expectations or because your parents want you to be or whatever it is, why are you here? Good question. This passage is going to question that. Second question is when God's Word says something that you don't like or agree with and it will eventually, it inevitably will, what will you do? Will you just walk away? Will you stay even if you don't understand it or necessarily agree with it? What will you do when God's Word runs counter to the culture and to what your thoughts are about whatever life is about? FYI, the 12 disciples, uh, the apostles, face the same question that you and I are facing and what the crowd faced today. What will be your response to the Word of God, to the words of Jesus, even this morning? Much discussion going on in the world today, or in the church today, concerned, head-scratching even, concerning the decline of the Western church. We see that 
I was talking to someone earlier about just how this church is closed, that church is closed, and, and, and culturally there's few people have an interest in, in Jesus, at least in the Western church, United States church, and by extension, following Jesus. We see that, especially the younger generation. Why is that? You could say multiple factors, but I, will, I believe there are two primary reasons why there's a decline in churches. The first is this, is that God's Word is not being fully taught. Pastors, ministries are selective in what they teach. And they're teaching to make people feel good about themselves, about their bondage to sin. Or a second reason is God's word is being proclaimed and people don't like it. And just like in John chapter 6, they no longer walk with Jesus. So two of those two things. Paul warned a young Timothy, a young pastor named Timothy of this occurring. And if you look in your Bibles to uh, first, second. Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 and verse 3 for a moment. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and part of it's the times in which we live at the end of the age, the Bible says to be a fallen way of, of those who, who proclaim faith. But 2 Timothy 4, 2, Paul exhorts young Timothy, Timothy, young pastor, he says, proclaim the word, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, well that doesn't sound like much fun, exhort with great patience and with instruction. Verse 3, for the time will come, will they not endure sound doctrine, sound teaching, but want to have their ears tickled, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And sadly, we see much of this taking place in some churches across our land. It's just sad. I won't mention names. I could, but I won't. People then and people now are seeking Jesus for what He will do for them. And sadly, many preachers, like some, just are telling people what they want to hear rather than preaching the Word of God. And they're fostering a consumer-driven culture of what will Jesus do for me today? We're going to find in chapter 6, Jesus didn't coddle that crowd. He's going to confront them on their ill-founded or ill-based, consumer-driven motivation for following Him. He's going to reveal their motives. Having said that, John chapter 6, John chapter 6, I'm reading verses 22 to 40. It's a long chapter. We're going to give you part 1, as I mentioned, part 1 and part 2 message in the Bread of Life Discourse. I'm reading John chapter 6, beginning verse 22. And the Word of God says... The next day, the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except for one, and that Jesus had not entered with the disciples into the boat, but the disciples had gone away alone. There came other boats from Tiberias to the place where they eat their bread, after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father, God, has set a seal. Therefore they said to him, Well, what will we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work that you, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. They said to him, Well, then what do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the man in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread to eat out of, out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, verse 32, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who gives given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And then he said to them, O Lord, always give us, this, give us this bread. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in, him will believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. And the one who comes to me will certainly not cast out. For I have come down of heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that, uh, that he has given me all that I, would, 
that all he has given me, I would lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. We're going to stop here for this morning and never go past verse 40. Going back to verse 22, we get the context. To recap chapter 6, the first half of the book, the first 21, ver 21 verses, Jesus, we call, had performed the tremendous miracle of multiplying, multiplying the fish and the loaves to feed over 5,000 people. He then had slipped away because the crowd was intending to take Jesus by force to make, him a, to make him king, to make him a political messiah, to save him from Rome, and to take care of them all the rest of their days. That night, he did another miracle of walking on water as he came out to the disciples who were caught in the middle of a windstorm in the Sea of Galilee. And so the crowd was searching for Jesus the next morning, and they finally caught up with him at Capernaum. And we'll pick up reading verse 22 again. Again, the next day, the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no small boat there except one, and Jesus not entered it with the disciples into the boat, that the disciples had gone away alone. Then other boats came from Tiberias to the place that they were, ate the bread with the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats, came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? So John gives us a GPS location, global positioning location. I like to do this in John, know where we were. Remember the Sea of Galilee, Bethsaida, where the feeding of the 5,000 was, took place on the northeast shore. And Jesus sent the disciples away by boat. And the, after, they, after that occurred, he went up on the mountain to pray. They got in the windstorm. He walked in on the water. And they landed in Gennesaret, which is on the northwest shore, just west of Capernaum. And Capernaum was the home base of Jesus, his headquarters. He was staying at Peter's house. They have done excavations in Israel and on the Sea of Galilee. It's, it's pretty cool. And they knew where he was. He, when Peter was around, when Jesus was around, he was pretty much hanging around Peter's house. With a, it was a large house, and so for the twelve and others. So they came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And they found him. And they said, well, how did you get here? Verse 26, Jesus just calls them on it. He says, well, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Jesus called them out on their motives. They didn't really care how he got there. They had a good meal and breakfast. They were hungry. They wanted breakfast. That's what's just going on. They're saying, well, I had a good dinner, dinner last night, but what's for breakfast? I would like to have a dinner omelet with you know, fries on the side and you know, hash browns, whatever. And they're looking for another free meal. What were their motives? They're not thinking Jesus knew him as the Son of God. They were looking for handouts. A consumer-based following. In other words, we talked about basically that type of consumer, that type of believer, if you would, is I am the Lord and Jesus is my servant. Is what Jesus is going to do for me today, not who he is and how can I serve him, but how can Jesus serve me? That was a mentality. And folks, to be quite honest, and many amongst churchianity today, that's the motivation of many people. Is what's Jesus going to do for me today? Not, it's not what I'm going to do for Jesus today. So he calls them on it. He says, don't work, verse 27, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures eternal life, for the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father, God, has set a seal. Don't work. Don't seek or strive after you return and talking about not working. Jesus admonished them not to seek after him for the free food, but to seek him because of who he is and that he gives eternal life. So they're focused on the things of this world, the physical things. That's all they cared about. Jesus is trying to shift their thought process to something more enduring. And so many times, even Christians fall the trap of living in view of this world only. TLO, this life only, the things, the material things, and the, and the things that's involved, whether it's health or food or toys or whatever. And there's far something far greater, far more enduring, that is life eternal and life in heaven. Folks, the 60 or 70 or 80 or whatever many years we sit on this earth is nothing compared to eternity with God in heaven. Yet so often the things of this world have really captured our hearts. 
verse 28. So I said to them, well, what shall we do that may work do the works of God? What work must we do? See, Judaism, tragically, had degenerated to a works-oriented religion. If you did this, you checked this box, you did this, you did this, you didn't do that, didn't do this, you checked this box of do's and don'ts, and when it's all said and done, you're deemed righteous and right before God. That was a works-based religion. As long as they go to the tithe, they do this, they go to you know, celebrate Sabbath and, and do all these things. I'm okay with God. Especially the Pharisees were really into that. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him who He sent. And John emphasizes the word believe in this gospel. The word believe is used 241 times in the New Testament. John, it's 98 times in John's gospel alone that this word is used. John really emphasizes believe, believe, believe. Not working for something, but believing in a person, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you can't work your way to heaven, but you must believe in the Son. And folks, there's many people today who think that they're going to heaven based on their national heritage, based on their family tree, they're raised in a Christian home, or they've been confirmed, or whatever that means, they've been baptized, they were a member of such and such a church, and they do this, they check the boxes, think that's going to get them in heaven. And it won't. You must believe in Jesus, that he died for your sins and rose again the third day. Verse 30, John 6, verse 30. So they said to him, Oh, well, what do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Hello? What did Jesus just do the previous day? He fed close to 15,000 people with five little rolls, dinner rolls, and two fish. They needed another sign? Really? What were they really thinking? Their tummies were talking. They were hungry. Where's the next meal? Sadly, there are those in Christian circles who seek signs and wonders. My friends, miracles, signs, and wonders will not lead you to saving faith. I'll repeat it. Signs and wonders does not result in saving faith. And many people are looking for this sign. Well, they have a miracle. Like, that means I have to have another miracle tomorrow. And I look and listen and look. And, and the list goes on and the search goes on and on. My friend, miracles, signs and wonders will not save you. Only faith in a person, Jesus Christ. Continuing, verse 31 to 33. They said, Our fathers ate man in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it's not Moses who gave you the bread out of heaven, but it's my Father who gave you the true bread out of heaven. And this is the bread, for the bread of God is that which comes out from heaven and gives life to the world. In verse 31, he says, You know, Moses gave us manna. You see, they're, they're still hung up on the bread, still hung up on the next meal. And he's referring to Moses, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, when God led the, the people of the nation of Israel out of Egypt, he wandered in the uh, waters for 40 years, and God provided manna. It's a very interesting manna. It's like a, it's like a white powder. It, they, it showed up by morning like the morning dew, and they gathered up and they baked with it. You can have manicotti, you can have all kind, manna souffle, all kinds of good, lots of 101 dishes you could do. But they still grumbled about that after a time, by the way. People were grumbling about the manna God supernaturally provided in the middle of the wilderness. Well, they're drawing, so look, Moses you know, gave us men to eat in the wilderness for 40 years. Well, what are you going to do for us? Again, where's their motivation? Consumer driven. What's Jesus going to do for me? Verse 32. Jesus corrects him in verse 32. He says, he says uh, Moses didn't give him the food. God gave it to them. Again, Jesus is going to try to shift their, their, their emphasis off the physical food to eternal life. He said, truly, truly, I say to you. Again, we talked about that last time. Truly, truly, that's a double affirmative of the amen, amen. And I use an illustration of um, algebra exponents and algebra. Some of you remember algebra exponents. Remember, uh, multiplication is 
10 times 2 is 20, but 10 squared, remember the 10 with a little 2 is, is 10 times 10 is 100. And that's the emphasis. This is truly, truly, this is the true statement. I'm double affirm affirming it. Listen very carefully. It is not Moses who gave the bread out of heaven, but my father who gave you the true bread out of heaven. And he's trying to get them to think about what they're saying. See, the man in the wilderness was only temporary. And it only met the physical need of the body. The father was giving something far greater. A true food, a nourishment, and abundant eternal spiritual life in the person of Jesus Christ and faith in him. Verse 34, they said, well, Lord, always give us this bread. <laughs> Again, still hung up on the food for the tummy. Verse 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. What a statement. Some things about this statement, you talk about it. First off, by equating himself with bread, Jesus is saying that like the man that came down of heaven, to give, sustain, give and sustain physical life, Jesus came down out of heaven and would give us life that we might have Zoe or eternal spiritual life. The life Jesus is referring to is not physical life, but he, as a spiritual life, as I mentioned. Again, he's trying to get them to shift off the, off the physical food to spiritual realities. And he's contrasting what he brings with the bread he miraculously multiplied the day before to the bread which leads to eternal life. And finally, very importantly, Jesus making yet another claim concerning who he is, that he is God. That phrase, I am, uh, I'm an E, it means to, ex to be or to exist. This phrase speaks of the self-sufficient existence of God. Or if I may use a 75 cent theological term, you may have ever heard you ever into a Bible college or a systematic theology called aseity. Aseity is the quality of being self-originated, self-success, self-sufficient, independent, and autonomous. You don't need anything. And that's what the God, when, Jesus, when God spoke to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, he says, tell the people, I am have sent you. And they immediately understood, because that word there, in the translate out of the Hebrew is we get the word Yahweh. And you understand that term, I am, meaning Yahweh, they're talking about God, the one who created all things, and the, the, the God, same God who called Israel. By the way, only Jesus can make that claim. You and I cannot make that claim. We are created beings. We are dependent upon our Creator for our existence. You can't live apart from God. In fact, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for your parents. And you'd be informed in your mother's womb, unless you're a hash, I don't know, but most people are, you know, are born. And even then, we need air, we need water, we need food, we have temporary, temporary, you know, temperature restrictions we have to live in, we need shelter, and all those things just to stay alive. Without those things, physical life ends. And we know that. Only Jesus can make that claim because of who he is. He is God come in the flesh. And Jesus' great claim is he is the source of eternal spiritual life. Again, if we believe in Jesus, we'll never thirst, we'll never hunger spiritually. And he will satisfy the longing of the soul. You know, you can have a belly full of food, but be spiritually empty and starving. And there's a lot of empty, lonely, desperate souls living in very wealthy mansions across our land and around the world, as well as in huts. Only Jesus can satisfy the longing of your soul. We come to John chapter 6, verse 36 through 40. But I said to you that you have seen me, yet you do not believe. Again, they had seen his miracle. They heard his claim. They did not connect it. They refused to connect. There was something going on there. And Jesus is going to explain what's going on with these people in verses 37 to 40. He says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And no one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. 
For I come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of God, the will of him who sent me, that of all that he gives given to me, I lose nothing, but will raise it up on the last day. Well, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up at the last day. And verses 37 to 40 are some very profound truths found in this, in this, in this passage. It contains Jesus' explanation of how the process of how salvation works. They're truly profound. And be quite honest, I don't fully understand it. And no one can fully grasp and understand the significance of what's being said. And theological arguments have raged throughout the centuries. Lots of books written. Theological camps have been established concerning the subject of God's election, of God's sovereign choosing of people to believe, and that of free will or man's responsibility to choose to believe or not believe. Both are present at this verse. Look at this, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and then when it comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Both are present, and also in verse 40. Well, it's kind of a paradox. Now, some said a paradox is two doctors standing on the street corner, but that's not quite right. A paradox is two seemingly contradictory statements, incompatible concepts, abiding side by side. And to illustrate a paradox, it's kind of like the Reading Sundial, Sundial Bridge. It's a beautiful bridge. And by the way, just a footnote, there's the Sundial Bridge in Reading has a sister bridge in Jerusalem. Just so you know, I saw that. I said, what's the Reading Sundial Bridge doing here? That there's another exact bridge, the same man, architect who built it, is in Jerusalem. But that's another story for another time. But the Sundial Bridge is an amazing bridge. I'm sure you've seen it. I hope you go down to see the lights down at Christmas. It's very beautiful in the, in the, in the gardens down there. They have this time of year. It's, pretty, it's worth taking your family off if you have not seen it. It's, it's pretty cool. But the Sundial Bridge is a very unique bridge. It's a suspension bridge. It's connected on either shore bank of the Sacramento River, you know, and it's got, you know, steel and girders in there. But it's also got wire cables that are suspended over the Sacramento River. There's no middle strut. And this under tension. Those cables are not just loosely flapping. They're under tension. And so is with these two truths of God's word. God's sovereignty and election and man's responsibility to believe. They're held in tension and they work together. There's no contradiction. We don't quite understand it, but they do, they're, they're there together. Let's look at it a little closer. Verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. God calls and draws people to himself. Well, look at two scriptures. First off, let's look to Ephesians chapter 1. Keep a pen, uh, pen, pen in John. Look to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through verse 6. Ephesians 1, 3 to 6. In the great book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul writes... He says some pretty amazing things. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as, verse 4, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we will be holy and blameless before Him. In love, he predestined or he chose us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. So we see here, he chose us before the world was even created, before the earth was even created and suspended in the air, in the atmosphere, in the universe. God chose you in him. That's pretty deep. We're swimming at the deep end of the pool here now. Another scripture to look at is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8, 9, and 10. Paul writes, Timothy says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and has called us 
with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ from all eternity. Before Genesis 1-1 even took place, which says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, before all that took place, God knew you and he chose you. Well, someone asked Charles Spurgeon one day how, how that can be. Spurgeon says this, he said, God chose me before I came into the world because if he had waited for who I got here, he never would have chose me. You know, if God really knew what we were like, he didn't wouldn't have chosen it. That choice was made long before you and I were ever conceived in the world, in our mother's womb, long before the world was ever made. God chose you. That's profound. But there's the, that's one side of the coin. The other side of, the, of this tension is that the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Well, who is coming to me? The individual who chooses to come. Look at verse 40. It says, this is in John chapter 6, verse 40. This is my father, the one who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up at the last day. God who created this angel is a choice. So we see together the teaching of God's election and man's responsibility to choose to believe. We're seen together in these verses. They coexist, they work together, they're in attention, but they're friends, they do not be to be reconciled. Someone again asked Charles Spurgeon, well, how he reconciled election in man's will? He said, I don't. I don't have to reconcile friends. They work together. It doesn't matter who you are. There's a legitimate offer today. If you, if you are seeking Jesus Christ and, 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 and you hear the gospel message, you will be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, For all, all, whosoever, love the King James, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter nationality, what language you speak. It doesn't matter what you've done or haven't done. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, sadly, some people get, some people get off in tangents in their, and they get off in their theological camps and they forget something. There's both truth to both sides of the coin. I think of William Carey. He was a missionary to the India. He was in the UK, and he was a, at a Baptist convention. He was a minister, and uh, he, was, he was asked people, but what about the Great Commission? Remember the Great Commission? Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, teach them, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, well, what about the people in India? And the older minister says, a young man, sit down. If God so chooses to elect him, he'll do it. He doesn't need your counsel. He'll do it without you. But well, wait a second. The Bible says in Romans, how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they hear? For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, there's, there's where the tension is. We are called in Jesus Christ. And if you're hearing this message, God is calling you. You're hearing the message. You need to respond. If you're not hearing this, if it just makes no sense to you, then... I encourage you to listen very carefully. For the Bible says not, God's not willing for any to perish, but to all to come to repentance. We all need to repent. How do you describe it? It's, there's no adequate story. I think of a, of a painting, it was a painting of a doorway and a, and a wall. And over the grave door, the door or the door sill was this, or the doorway was this. Whosoever may enter. Then once you enter through the door, you look back, you find the words engraved, chosen from the foundation of the world. My friend, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are one of God's chosen. At the same time, He's working in people's lives. And if you, you, you're hearing this message and you, you sense a need in your heart, you need to respond. Is this not going to happen? You have the choice to be made. You have to be, choose to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That whosoever means you, my friend, are you hearing the call of God this morning? Verse 39, John 6, 39, as we wrap this message up this morning. This is the will of him who sent me, that all who has given me, I lose nothing, but will raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him who will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Those whom the, draw their father, the Father draws to Jesus will be saved, not one will be lost. Talking about the security or assurance of the believer. Whoever believes in Jesus, that he died for you and rose again, you currently possess 
eternal life. See, eternal life doesn't happen when you die. Eternal life occurs, you're born again the moment you ask Jesus and your life to be your Savior. In conclusion, the people grabs a part of what Jesus was saying and, 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 and they didn't like it. They did not like it. One, because they wanted to work their way to heaven. They thought they were already good to go with God and God saying, no, you need, you need to believe in Jesus. Also, Jesus claimed to be God and that it was just was a th it was through the Jewish people that for a loop. They were offended. And Jesus is not going to stop them. He's going to really annoy them in the following verses, but we'll see that next time. To the point that they no longer walked with him and they just walked away. In conclusion, Jesus is the bread of life. He is the source of eternal life. And one must come to him, behold him, and believe in him to obtain this eternal Zoe life. It's not an act, not a work, but rather a look by faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It is the gift of God, not of works that no one should boast. It's God's will that you believe in Jesus, whom he has sent. And the question is this, have you believed in God's Son? And maybe I'll ask two quick questions just to help you to know where you are. And the question is this, if you were to die today, and by the way, if the Lord should tell you, you will die someday, Everyone will have a memorial service someday. Some sooner than others. That's, that's in God's hands. But if you were to die today, do you know beyond a shadow of doubt that you're going to heaven? Do you have some concerns about this? You need not be. If you're not certain, you need to be sure. Because my friend, we are all only one heartbeat away from eternity. Something to happen. A plane could land on the church. You could have a car accident on the way home. Stuff happens. Life happens. Hopefully not a tornado, but it's California. Weird things happen. If you did die today and you stood before God, vision is. And he should ask you why he should let you into his heaven. What would you be? What would you say? Well, God, I should go to heaven because I'm so handsome. Not. God, I should go to heaven because I've been, I've been a good boy or a good girl. I've been good. Uh, God, you should let me into heaven because uh, you, know, you look at my life, you, the, the balance scales, my, my good deeds have outweighed my, outweighed my bad deeds. God, you should let me into heaven because I was raised in a Christian home. Or you should rate me in heaven because I'm a member of such and such a church, or I've been baptized, or gone through theological training. Or will your answer be, Lord, I don't deserve to be in heaven, but I believed in Jesus Christ as my Savior, that He died for my sin and rose again on the basis of His sacrifice for my sin. That's why you'll let me into heaven. How is it with your soul this morning? It's God's will that you believe in Jesus whom he has sent. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We still have a lot more to cover in this great, great chapter. But Father, we break for time. We pray that we would evaluate why we do what we do. Why we are following you is because we're seeking you, the source of all life. Are we looking to serve you, or are we just here for what Jesus can do for me? Lord, I want this, or I need that. I expect you to do this, I expect you to do that. Lord, please speak to our hearts. As we examine our hearts, Lord, may be our heart drive, our heart motive, just because we want to see Jesus. We want to know him more, and to serve him in the time in which we have on this earth. Father, thank you 
Thank you for your Holy Spirit for speaking to our hearts and lives. If there's changes to be made, may you give us the power and the ability to make those changes and to reevaluate and to renew our walk with you. For as Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we turn? For you alone have the words of eternal life. Thank you, dear Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Let us close with a song. Who died?